Thanks very much, and it's a great honor for me to present. My name is Patrick, and I re represent a number of different institutes in Singapore. And um, I think in the fifth, next 15 minutes, what I'd like to do is to give you an oversight of what we're doing in Singapore and how we're trying in an early way to try to move some of the research that we've been doing into the uh, clinical practice. And I do like uh, Dr. Manelio's point that a lot of this must be pitched as an evolution of current practice rather than as a revolution. And I think you'll see some of that here. Speaking from an even smaller country <laughs> than Belgium, where we have a population size of about 5 million, I think uh, you'll see that this presents some opportunities, but also challenges as well. So um, how do I move this? So just one slide on the overview. So this will be a very pragmatic, practical talk, I think, uh, compared to maybe some of the high-level stuff uh, you've been hearing before. <laughs> just one slide. So um, the, our foray into biomedical sciences really began about 10 years ago. And it is over in the past five years, it's seen steadily increasing support from the Singapore government. And the last tranche was about $2.6 billion uh, in biomedical funding for the past five years. And this, the funding arises from three major ministries, uh, trade and industry, education, and health. And while that's good in the sense that there are many different grant agencies, it can be a challenge trying to align the different types of needs of these different ministries when you're trying to talk about something like genomic medicine. And one, one positive aspect is that this has resulted in a lot of research institutes. Some of you may be familiar with the Singapore Bi Biopolis and also a number of academic medical centers. And some of my colleagues in Singapore uh, are here representing those. So I think that there is this uh, receptacle, I think, for the use of uh, genomic, genomic me me medicine. And uh, I'm going to certainly use stomach cancer as a basis for that in terms of some of the experiences. So the area that I think Singapore has tried to position itself is as a receptacle for understanding Asian-specific conditions. And one of these is obviously Asian cancers. Uh, this is the main area that we've been working in. And this is stomach cancer and the incidence of, of stomach cancer in different parts of the world. And you see that it's primarily present in many parts of Asia. I think my colleagues from Japan and South Korea will agree. But globally, you can see that uh, stomach cancers are actually the second highest cause of global cancer death. So what this means is that this is a disease that we need to figure out how to treat better. And I think the intersection of this with genomics uh, presents some very interesting opportunities in being sort of like poster children for how we can use genomic medicine. Um, just two studies that I think highlight this and more how do we use this in a way that builds on current clinical practice. Uh, so this is just one study that um, is highlights what is uh, that basically this p uh, p paper published in the Lancet highlights the use of trastuzumab targeting uh, gastric cancers that are amplified in the HER2 oncogene uh, similar to breast cancer and this is the first targeted therapy in the gastric cancer um, and this actually is a positive for these patients that have amplification of HER2 but for other 90% of cases, uh, the, there are no um, targeted opportunities available. So this is where genomics can come in, where we can do a landscape survey, find new opportunities. Uh, this, in this particular work, uh, what we find which is quite interesting for a cancer point of view is that besides the HER2 population, uh, there are distinct segments of, uh, of gastric cancers that actually amplify different components of the RTK RAS MAP kinase pathway. And this obviously is a pathway where there are significant targeted therapies available. So in one sense, this is a very simple way of genomic medicine where we can stratify patients. Validation is very important to uh, have all of these studies given the certainty that this is not a one-off finding. And uh, this is just a, a comparison of the data from the Ch Chinese gastric cancer patients to the TCGA cohort, primarily patients from Europe and Caucasian. And for the most part, you can actually see many, if not all of the similar amplifications being seen in both. So, you know, in, in a sense, I think that for many of these conditions, we have the validation and prevalence, but how do we, then do we move this into the clinic is, I think, an, another challenge that we um, need to think about. Um, another study that I think highlights, you know, how do we use this as a way of um, evolving our current knowledge rather than as a revolution it comes from a transcriptome uh, profiling study where I think it really uh, highlights the challenge of how can we position this sort of work as an improvement on current pathology rather than a let's kick the pathologist out of, the, out, out of a job. And so uh, this is a study where by using uh, consensus clustering, uh, we, we can find three distinct subgroups of uh, gastric cancers. 
And by doing the standard pathway analysis, we can find distinct pathways associated with each cancer type. And also these different uh, subtypes actually have different preclinical, at least drug sensitivities. This has yet to be validated. Uh, but what was interesting from this is uh, this particular subtype over here that uh, I think uh, represents how we can use this as an e e evolution. So uh, it's been known since the 1960s that gastric cancers, and I apologize for those of you who don't work on stomach cancer, but this is the only thing that I, I, I know, um, is that uh, gastric cancers can be divided into intestinal and diffuse, and this is the standard pathology practice. However, what's interesting is that a number uh, of years ago, it turns out that this, but the, what pathologists have known for a while, but it's sort of like been embedded in the pathology world, is that in the spinal subtype, actually there are two particular variants. Uh, one type that has markers of normal gastric epithelia and one not. So it's, it's actually, there's third heterogeneity here. And when they map it to um, the gene expression subtypes, it's possible and that this actually may, may correspond to one of those molecular subtypes and one of the different ones. So I think that by talking to pathologists and asking them how does this reflect your own personal experience, we can begin to build bridges between the, ge the genomic sector and standard pathology. And so uh, this is uh, currently the consensus being done. This is the pathway that most of us will learn in medical school about how stomach cancer develops. But by intersecting pathology information, there may be a separate subtype over here that, uh, that re represents that new genomic subtype we're seeing. And we're currently working with these pathologists to see if we can improve that. So this is a way of getting them used to understanding <coughs> genomic data. Uh, this is just one sort of um, um, approach and you know, this is not just stomach cancer. I think that uh, uh, over the past number of years, uh, Singapore has done pretty well in identifying uh, genes, gene polymorphisms associated with uh, different types of aging cancers. I just highlight this is a very nice one, where this is a, uh, a deletion and 2.1 KB indel, so very hard to see by standard NGS sequencing. Uh, in BIM, in only present in Asian populations, that seems to predict uh, inferior risk responses to, to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and also, this a paper from the Cancer Science Institute looking at prognostic markers in um, liver cancer and other Asian specific cancer. So, I think from a discovery biology point of view, we've been doing a pretty good job at finding things to translate. So, the next question is that how do, when do we move that to the next step? And uh, this is where it comes intersects with the medical system, in, and this is where you know, we have challenges but opportunities. So one of the things that we've tried to do, and this is not, this is, it's, not the, it's not the solution, but it's a pilot thing, is to establish a program called P Polaris, which is the North Star. This is where we want to get to in, in, in future, where we can try to see, can we have a national structure to look at how we can implement genomic medicine? Uh, it's funded for three years, about $20 million, uh, from the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, or one of those three agencies. And the idea is to pilot the use of cl clinical use of genomic testing, starting with uh, cancers and genetic disease. Uh, and, and in terms of operationally, what it really means is an, a nationwide network of cap college medical and pathology certified genomic laboratories running the same tests, running common informatic systems, sample preparation systems, so that we can standardize across the whole island. I mean, it's a tall order, so we're starting in a very pragmatic, uh, small way, and I'll sh show you what I mean. And we're about one year old into this program. Uh, some operating principles that we've, we've, we feel is important, and I'd like to raise these for discussions, is uh, something we felt that would be important to, for genomic, genomic medicine to work. The first operating principle that we thought would be important is that these genomic medicine labs running your high seeks or your my seeks should be deployed within an existing clinical framework. So as opposed to setting up your center as a standalone center, that, and the, the main one reason for that is just purely fi financial. If you're going to be trying to reimburse, if you have a standalone, that center is going to be bleeding red right from day one. But if it's part in a pathology department, pathology departments can cross cover through for example, lab medicine and so on. So I think that's one thing that, and this allows them to see it not as a threat, but as an evolution of their current pra pra practice. The second thing is that, you know, uh, single gene tests probably have had their heyday, but I would say that you know, for people that want to start genomic medicine, uh, you know, you need to have the framework to do basic genetic testing, single gene testing, before you can even start to think of doing a whole exome. 
And I think that is, uh, you know, so we, we need to learn by doing it, finding out where the pressure points are, and moving on from there. Um, the third point is that genomic tests should leverage on existing competencies. And I think this is where the Genome England study is that, you know, when you want to set up a new center, if there's already a lab that's re doing really good Sanger sequencing, you can use that lab for validation rather than having to set up your own system. But that requires trust and how do we get the funding to flow across different centers to reimburse that lab for that. And so I think that this is a more cost-effective way, but it does take more teamwork and more effort in, in place. So a lot of my time is spent meeting people and taking them out for lunch. <laughs> and I think lastly, I think it's one is that starting with tests as initial proof of concepts that provide true clinical utility will lead to clinician buy-in. So what we try to do is to highlight disease champions. These are people working in a particular domain. They are very influential. And we ask them, what would you like to measure that would make you change the way you treat your patient. And we start there and we build the test around that. And that we use that as a basis to learn and they themselves participate in how the clinical report is being generated. Uh, so this is the current status after one year. Uh, our first Polaris test, which I'll spend the next two slides talking about, is a very simple single uh, test, but uh, I think it has identified certain issues that we need to uh, fix. And it's uh, gonna be launched at the end of the month. Uh, the genomic labs them themselves are going for national certification in mid-24. It's going to be based on Illumina. And I'd like to talk to people here about what do they think is the necessity for reflex validation when you see a new variant called by, let's say, on, on a MySeq. How, how important do you think that is? Um, the test revenue. So these patients are actually being charged for, 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 for these tests. And what happens is that the revenue that is incurred from this test is equally split among the different centers contributing to the test on a cost recovery basis. And so this was important for sustainability. And finally, uh, what the next Polaris test that we're going to do uh, by the end of this year is a 90 gene GI, gastrointestinal cancer test, that has all of your favorite players on it. Um, so let me talk about this test over here because you know it's a Sanger test. It's a very simple test, but I think you know there are certain. It, it, it's, it let us to identify certain things that we need to fix in the system. Uh, the test is uh, is uh, targeting a condition called stromal corneal dystrophies, and most of the patients with this condition have a mutation in this gene. It's one gene, so it's very easy to do by Sanger. But I think it hits the flavors of the things that we can use to prove the use of genetic and genomic testing. For instance, by testing these patients, we can clinch the disease diagnosis. The location of the mutation in the gene directs different therapeutics that therapies that the, that the eye surgeon has to use. And it's important for screening of unaffected family members because these patients that are, have the test, even though if they don't have symptoms, should not go for LASIK. So I think it is all the flavors of something that has true clinical utility and the fact that we have a national center for eye diseases allows us to find our patients through this particular test. Uh, more, more importantly, it's, a, it's allowed us to try to integrate a number of the different academic medical centers. So one, uh, the National Eye Center provides the patients and the consultation, the ordering, they do the blood collection. So all of this is intersecting with the standard hospital practice that we're doing here. The National University Hospital System provides the DNA sequencing and the mutation report, and the GIS did the bioinformatics. Um, and so, and the test revenues are actually split among these three places. So in this case, actually this particular place gets the bulk of the revenue from the test. Um, and so, as a result of this, we've had certain challenges I'd like to close now, uh, but just three or four that I'd, like to, that I'd like to get your feedback on. The first one is that because we have different ministries, trying to get legal and licensing agreements across the institutions uh, is quite complex. So that's the first one. Second one, uh, Singapore has a very interesting system that the moment a patient's test crosses an academic me medical center, that test is charged at what we call a full rate. It can't be. And so this is some, 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 something that we need to uh, fix in the system because the goal of this is to get all of the people from different centers working together. There's a general lack of expertise in genetic and genomic counselors. So one of, a lot of our doctors have told to me, we would like to test, we would like to prescribe it, but I don't feel comfortable with it without a qualified counselor sitting in my clinic at the same time. So this is something that we are trying to address by sending more people for training. 
And finally, I think and one of the things I'd like to get back from this one is that we lack official policies on uh, how do you write the uh, in informed patient consent form, how do you deal with these incidental findings, and how do you aggregate your data from the patients that you're running a test on such that you can have a database that's itself a very valuable for future discovery. And what are, what's the, the fact that it's a clinical service, how does that feed into research? So I'd like to close there. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the audience, Professor John Wong and Professor Ching Wee Ju, who are here. And uh, thanks. And any questions? Thank you. Mark Williams, Geisinger. Could you talk a little bit about why uh, TGF-B1 uh, was uh, chosen as your exemplar for a single? I is this a condition that's more prevalent in uh, the, yeah. the population? Because it's, it's not one that has, at least that I'm aware of in this country, is being tremendously yes. prevalent. Yes. So uh, it, again, I think it's very pragmatic. We needed to have a poster child of a test that hit all of the bells of clinical utility, firstly. And we needed to have a, what we call a disease champion, a clinician that was willing to work with us over a six month basis to polish and build the test. Third thing was that there was actually research being on, ongoing in the center on this condition. So they had all of the patients, in the, the wild type and the mutant patients that we could assemble for, to rapidly validate the test. So I think that, and so we, we wanted some, something that we could, at least from the technical standpoint, all of the ingredients were there. But then we could, and we could use it as a test to see what the other challenges, the framework for how do we do the reimbursement. Because I think that's the important part. The technology, we can swap in and swap out. But how do we do those other bits? I needed something that we could stress test the system and find out where the weak points are. So we won't make a million dollars from it. But I think we've, we've done about five to 10 patients already. And you know, though, and I think that's, that's, and that's been uh, clinical benefit from these patients already. So I think that, uh, and, we, and we're going to do more. Once we have the framework set up, we can then use the same basis to do other ones along these similar framework. So that was the reason. Great, Terry Manolio, um, very neat project. And I'm, I'm wondering, the data that you generate from, from this are going to be useful to others who might want to interrogate the TGFB1 gene as well. Um, have you thought about how you, both you're interrogating other databases to see when you have a whole host of variants that may have no meaning at all, how you're doing that, and then how you can contribute to those databases, such as through things like the ClinVar database at, uh, at NCBI or others? Yes. So speaking as a researcher, I firmly believe 100% about the importance, the value of open sharing. And I think, however, I think that in order to reach that vision, we have to do it in steps. And there, there are significant uh, concerns, some of them emotional, some of them uh, you know, from, from a patient privacy point of view, as to what is the right version of the data that we can open up. Um, another tension is that a lot of the funding in our uh, was from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So they're obviously interested in this from a commercial standpoint. So you have that question of open access versus not. These are all, I think, issues that can be solved with further engagement of the different, because I think all of us have the same vision. But the getting there, I think, just takes step by step. So the, the, the vision, I think, is then to share all of that data that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to figure out the best way that I won't let us into trouble. Sure. Well, and, and I might just su suggest David Ledbetter and, and Heidi Rehm are, are here and are quite familiar with data sharing in, in, in ways that probably don't affect intellectual property and that sort of thing, but, but might want to talk with you a little Definitely. bit about yeah, getting this I'm, data. I'm here to learn on this. Thank you. Uh, George Patrinos, that's actually a question I want to ask to Tim. Uh, uh, two lectures before. Uh, one important argument for policymakers to, um, to incorporate genomics into healthcare is that they save money the national healthcare expenditure. So have you considered uh, doing an economic evaluation using this test so that it can become eventually cheaper yeah. for, for the patients? So uh, yes and no. Uh, and you, you, you may not like what I'm going to say, but again, it's, I think it's a very pragmatic. What we do, are going to do is that we're going to compare the cost of developing this test in Singapore and doing it versus the cost of this same center sending the test out overseas. Where, and so the pricing, we're still working on the final pricing of the test, but we can basically do it in-house at about one third of the cost, particularly if you factor in. So that's basically the, uh, the argument that we're going to say for cost effectiveness. Now, uh, we can talk more about this later on because a lot of this is patient pays. 
Um, so, but at the very least, we can say that you know, we, are, we actually bring a test to Singapore, leveraging on our research, and to bring at least healthcare costs for the individual patient down. I think we'll start there.